By the way, Hardy has a really great article that was published in Open Democracy uh, more than a year ago uh, called The Trifecta of Civil Resistance, Unity Planning and Nonviolent Discipline. Uh, and that is a good segue into the first, for me, for the first section of what I would like to uh, present to you today. Um, the heart of this presentation is about the core dynamics of civil resistance. But it's increasingly occurred to me, since I also wrote an article for uh, Open Democracy about a year and a half ago called uh, Civil Resistance, the Language of Power, that the problem that most people have in all walks of life who have an inkling about the existence of movements and campaigns that use nonviolent action in understanding what these campaigns and movements do has to do with the way they think about the underlying phenomena of which civil resistance is composed. And the way you think about something, to a large extent, is confined by or liberated by the language you use to talk to yourself, to think about the outside world and to think about yourself. Thinking is in language. It may seem to be notional, it may seem to be affective, but it is through words and language. And so our beliefs about, our ideas about, our interpretations of the world are very much informed by the language we use. And much of the language that we inherit from our family, from the media, from our friends, from institutions, from all the various sources of language, of talk, of text that is coming at us reflect a collection of worldviews that define what we later believe to be are our own personal possibilities, the possibilities of organizations, of groups, of parties, of political actors, of institutions, of campaigns, and of movements. And so what I want to do this time is to begin with a simple introduction to some of the common terms used to describe whether these, it's, uh, those who use these terms are aware of it or not, power in the world. So look at these two lists that you see in front of you of words, a left-hand column and a right-hand column. That's just the left hand and the right hand. It has nothing to do with ideology. On the left, you see a column of words that you may, if you look at them all, recognize as fairly commonly used in media or about media or about power. And you may notice that the terms in the right-hand column don't tend to be seen quite as much in the descriptions and the accounts, the narratives, the interpretation coming from media, coming from the academic world, coming from commentators of all kind. And there are reasons for that. And it has to do with the beliefs and the ideas that are encoded in now much of the way the world thinks about political and social phenomenon. We say at ICNC, oh, that person's thinking is very state-centric. When we say that, we mean that their perspective is based on the assumption that power comes from those who sit atop certain positions in states, or somehow come from states, or come from states because we recognize governments as powerful, and the rulers within those governments as having power, and then the laws they enact to which all of us must subscribe and to which we must obey have power over us. They confine us or they in some cases empower us if a certain law allows us to have certain benefits. Look at that single verb allows. So we tend to think in a pattern which suggests that what we are able to do is what we are allowed to do by states or governments. And it should be no accident to conclude that many governments are perfectly happy to have us think that way that our own activity, our own initiative, 
Our ability to do anything volitional is contingent upon what we are allowed to do by states, governments, rulers, and laws. And then just beneath that is the reality that the definitions of how power is used and should be used and that power which may be left over to be available for us are in fact protected by, the language is protected by, the language is persistently used by elites. Power holders who are part of elites who in many cases on a class basis or socially are self-perpetuated. And that's true as much in democratic societies as in undemocratic societies because it is often true in traditional societies. Elites set up institutions through which they educate people, through which they regulate life. There are lots of debates about the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of institutions. But if you go occasionally to an American Political Science Association meeting, as ICNC used to do with its exhibit before we realized after a few years that political scientists weren't listening to us, <laughs> you'll constantly hear the term institutions and the importance of setting up institutions which work. Many democracy promoters who come out of the world of political science and work for governments think that the most important thing you have to do when you go into a country is set up these institutions or work with the people who can set up the institutions so that they'll work well because the institutions will of course be those they have to be liberal, they have to be enlightened so that when they use power everyone will benefit. But this sustains this sense of structure as having power and the people as having what's left over. You get table scraps. You don't get to sit at the table and have the full meal. Somebody else is cooking the food, you're eating scraps. And all this creates conditions in the society. That institutions and power holders create conditions. And so when you read academic articles frequently or op-ed articles by policymakers or policy advisors about well, how to explain what happened in the Arab Spring, they fly into motion and will lead you to believe that somehow there was a Rubik's Cube of social and economic conditions that somehow had to magically sort itself so that then it was possible for someone to engage in resistance or rebellion. Again, trying to define down the opportunity even for contingency, much less the agency of individual people. This is a top-down theory of how power is distributed and furthermore it even defines power primarily as physical and the most authoritarian regimes which have to rely upon military and police power to do repression are the most anxious to define power as something that is physical so that you the individual who has a very tiny amount of potential physical power is daunted in your consideration of what it is possible for you to do. And so when finally there is agency, when finally there is resistance, this is defined as unrest. Oh my God, we're destabilizing our institutions. We're destabilizing our existing relationships between these institutions. We're, we're challenging authority. This is bad. This is something that has to be, you know, we, we, then the liberals decide, well, what do we do for these people so they stop being, stop engaging in unrest? So they stop destabilizing Disturbing. our precious institutions. Right, exactly. And then along come, and I'm not criticizing anybody here who is involved in conflict resolution, but then the, much of the conflict resolution community, particularly those who have, I'm, I, I'm tempted to define them by the, the size of their salaries, but I will not do this, <laughs> but, the, but those engaged in conflict resolution will come along and will say, well, how, how now do we, do we mitigate this unrest? How do we put uh, Humpty Dumpty back together again and then find out what everybody wants and come to a resolution of the conflict that satisfies everyone? Sometimes that can obscure the fact that there is a conflict, particularly if the people are on one side, that is based on such discontent and such systemic abuses or oppression that there is not going to be resolution until there is a shift in how power is not, not, is, it not, is not distributed, but is utilized. And that shift actually can occur without any action on the part of those who represent structure in society. The agency side of this chart virtually speaks for itself. 
What have state actors interestingly define everybody else as non-state actors? Each of us is a non-state actor here. The Fletcher School is a non-state actor. Tufts University is a non-state actor. Jim Lawson is a non-state actor, according to this definition. Now, some non-state actors are citizens. Sometimes people just refer to the people, the great unwashed, whether or not they're citizens or not. If there's no constitution which defines them as a citizen, well, maybe they're just people. But when you explore the dynamic of civil resistance, you discover that the people are really rather important in the functioning of any system. In a democracy, in an advanced society, they have to be taxed to provide revenue to the state. They have to consent to that taxation. One of our academic advisors always refuses to pay a certain percentage of his federal taxes because he will not feed the war machine, so he regularly expects to be sent to jail for this about once every 10 years for a few years. Um, because he's determined to withdraw his consent from taxation which benefits something that he believes is antithetical to the very principles on which the country itself is established. And he's willing to see through those principles to their final consequences for himself personally. When civil society awakens to the idea that consent can be withdrawn from an existing system, and recognizes that no one is actually inhibiting themselves from beginning to find space in which to organize, they may develop a movement which can acquire skills engaged in a deliberate conflict with an existing structure and develop power from the bottom up. This can be political power. It can redefine the nature of political relationships through resistance and then accomplish reform or even revolution. When we organize the ways in which we use language about existing institutions, states and structures, people, citizens, movements, the skills they can acquire, the, the um, resistance they can muster, we then begin to see the world in a much different way than the way in which the world is defined through the language of the conventional media and of the structures and institutions of most governments. It is not as if there is a conspiracy that is afoot with an office somewhere in Washington DC or wherever else it might be that tries to get people to use this language or think in this way. This is the inheritance of the historical position we find ourselves in. So there is a certain sense in which everyone engaged in a movement that uses civil resistance is also resisting history, is resisting the notion that an existing state of affairs must be accepted and tolerated, including the very way we think about that state of affairs. So my argument is that we cannot really understand how to produce power through movements unless we begin to examine how we discuss it and thus how we think about it, and thus how we think creatively and imaginatively about our conditions. Those of us who um, have studied and learned and absorbed the strategic understanding of the use of civil resistance uh, and have uh, engaged with those who have uh, used civil resistance in a strategic way are continuously revising our understanding of the underlying dynamic. We have to do that because this is historically a fundamentally new political phenomenon and social phenomenon. And how this resistance is developed and applied must be understood so that its full capacities can be utilized by those to whom knowledge about civil resistance can be transferred. What we're doing at FSI is transferring knowledge that those of us who have collected bits and pieces of the knowledge that exists thus far in history, we're transferring what we know to you in the hope and the expectation, if not the demand, that you will become future contributors and developers of this same knowledge and raise this knowledge to a higher level because there is much we do not yet understand. And at every FSI, there are people who notice, well, wait a minute, how does that work with this? And it may be that we don't know, in which case you having noticed this gap or this disparity in knowledge can 
help to teach the next generation and the generation after that, that may open up to be a clue to how to vastly expand what we call people power, the power politically and socially and even economically that is produced through campaigns and movements that understand this central dynamic. Obviously, now we have reached a point, in large part thanks to the Arab Spring, where even the mainstream media is acknowledging that nonviolent resistance by ordinary people can be a force for rights and justice. The first person who I think stated in a relatively clear way the core dynamic of nonviolent resistance was this man, Frederick Douglass, who was an African American, had originally been a slave, was freed by his master, educated himself, became one of the leaders of the abolitionist movement in the United States before the Civil War. He was also the first individual invited to the White House for a meeting by a president of the United States, who was Abraham Lincoln. Douglas was assertive. So I want to take you through this really extraordinary statement for something having been said in the 1850s. He said, power, meaning the people sitting in the structure, power concedes nothing, and it never will. Find out what any people will submit to, and you will have found out the exact measure of the injustice or the wrong which will be imposed on those people. In other words, those who have power sitting at an elite level will deliberately, or just by virtue of the way in which they use power, leave most people in a state of injustice, and that will be proportionate to those people's willingness to submit, which will be exploited to leave those individuals in a state of injustice or without rights. And all this will continue, Douglas said, until it's resisted. It's not going to stop of its own accord. We're not all suddenly going to slowly evolve morally and ethically to the point when we decide, wow, I have too much power, I should really share it with everybody else. Many people must be brought along by a, the developing understanding of how better societies emerge from a more equitable sharing of power. But Douglas understood that that process was not going to come about on its own. It would not mysteriously self-organize. It would have to be compelled, and it would have to be compelled by those who did not have power. He said the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those those whom they oppress. That's why, interestingly, in so many different languages, one of the most important words used by campaigns as a rallying cry or even as the definition, the name for the organization, is enough. We've stopped, we're, we're stopping endurance at this point. It's over. We're going to come at you until we can develop a new proposition and new relationships in this country. About 50 years after Douglas um, taught that understanding of power, Leo Tolstoy, who was a pacifist and had a principled attachment to nonviolent action as part of his periodic campaigning against conscription in Tsarist Russia, philosophically minded as he was, he offered this probably seemingly vacuous thought for the time but from the perspective of where we sit today, it's really a rather interesting proposition. He said that at some point in human development, public opinion, which, by the way, he didn't have in mind as being the result of a public opinion poll. He meant what everybody thought together, collectively and forcefully, as a society, that eventually public opinion would change, not just structures and institutions, but the whole structure of human life, and that that would make violence superfluous. In this statement he didn't focus on how odious the use of violence might be. He just simply said that it would ultimately become superfluous and therefore not taken up as a form of action. Gandhi was overwhelmed, he said, by Tolstoy's writings. They had a correspondence for about six or seven years before Tolstoy passed away. The key to understanding Gandhi's um, 
development of the use of nonviolent resistance, which was very pioneering at the beginning of the 20th century, in my view, is because he was a voracious reader of newspapers. Newspapers in the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century were rather more substantive, I'm sorry to say, than newspapers today. But he read everything he could get his hands on about Irish resistance to British rule, which was very much uh, boiling in those years, and also about resistance to the Tsar in Russia, which culminated initially in the 1905 Russian Revolution, the first Russian Revolution, which was predominantly nonviolent and began with a march organized by a priest of workers in St. Petersburg, which absolutely shook the Tsarist regime to its core. Gandhi was utterly fascinated by this. He absorbed the narratives and the stories about how tactics were being used, and he began to see possibilities for organizing campaigns of Indian South Africans in the first decade of the 20th century. And as we know, when he moved to India, he then developed the skills that he had incubated in his own campaigns in South Africa, brought them to a higher level in India, and even came to the point of defining his use of these tactics as a kind of nonviolent weapon in order to resist British colonial rule of India, which had gone on for almost two centuries by the time that Gandhi began his campaigns in the 1920s, which campaigns consisted of many of the tactics we're familiar with today. In fact, the media is over-familiar with because of its continuous showing of marches or protests, marches and protests, but other kinds of tactics which even at this time the mainstream media is insufficiently aware of, but which Gandhi also developed to a higher tactical form. Refusal to pay taxes, boycotts, resignations, tactics of non-cooperation, blockades, active physical interference with transportation and with the conduct of the affairs of the state. The uh, now famous uh, American scholar of nonviolent action, Gene Sharp, uh, presumed in the 1960s, 1960s to organize about 300 of the tactics that had commonly been used by Gandhi and through some of the other major campaigns of civil resistance into these three categories. There are other ways to categorize these tactics. The number of tactics that are at u that are used in the world today is still growing, but use this categorization um, as you wish. Protest and persuasion tactics, tactics, as I said, of non-cooperation, and then of active intervention. So the dynamic of resistance that iteratively and suggestively I've already tried to uh, bring out comes down to this in my view. When the people deprive an oppressor, a structure, an institution, a government that is denying you your rights, when the people deprive that ruler or that oppressor of their consent, you haven't asked us whether we like these conditions that you're forcing us to live in, and because you haven't asked us, because we don't have a voice, the power that you're using that leaves us in a condition of injustice is not only unjust, it's not legitimate, which is an argument of a higher order. You question the right of the state or the oppressor or the ruler to do what they are doing. In, a, in essence, you say what you are doing is not only wrong, it is illegitimate politically. This is a very powerful political idea. And when, and if there is the reality or even simply the fig leaf of elections in a particular country, that's the ruler's tacit acknowledgement that he has to be seen to be acquiring your consent to acquire his legitimacy. Much progress has already been made over the course of the last century by many movements acting cumulatively to produce lessons to educate us indirectly, partly through media, partly through education, traditional education, in the fact that rulers, so rulers today, it's impossible to be a ruler today with at least having some awareness of the fact that you have to 
go through the motions of looking like you have legitimacy. But when the people deprive an oppressor of their consent, that reduces the legitimacy. And that turns out to be very important. Because when enough people refuse to cooperate, what they are doing to a static structure, a closed loop structure, in which arrangements for exercising power are finite and must be supported economically, what happens when enough people refuse to cooperate is that that challenges, that calls into question the sustainability of the profit model of the existing system, of the stability model of the existing system. That increases the cost to the system of its ability to maintain control. This destabilizes existing power arrangements. So legitimacy goes down and costs go up. And then all the people who are involved in, in enforcing the rules of the system because they derive a benefit, they derive a salary, they get a little extra cut, they might even have a Swiss bank account if they're high enough up in the system. They then begin to say, well, wait a minute, this is not working. This setup is not working the way it used to work. What, what, if, this, what if this system isn't in place in 10 years? I'm only 29 years old or I'm only 36 years old. What will I be doing? Who will I be working for in 10 years? And all these questions, this questioning begins within this static structure. This is toxic to authoritarian systems and it is also awakening to people who have previously had no power. It opens the question of what is going to happen in that society or in that polity. And that starts the disintegration of the sets of assumptions and beliefs which people on both sides of the aisle, if you will, people on the structure and the agency side have always entertained. And then people begin to think very creatively about how they should think and what they should do. And then if there are organizers who understand this dynamic and develop a plan to take sequential action at a number of different levels in that society, they can then further activate an awareness of what it might be possible to do. So, as I said, when the system's legitimacy drops and its costs rise, people who enforce the system, even in police and military organizations, begin, even, even if it's only silent within their own thinking, to doubt the endurance of that system. That's the core dynamic as we see it, those of us who teach strategic nonviolent action. And that core dynamic has been present in almost a hundred campaigns and movements that have unfolded in the last 100 years. The number of these is really quite astonishing when you look horizontally at the historical record. You're familiar with many of these. I won't go into them specifically. You will hear this week, you've already heard, about the struggle of African Americans and other Americans for full civil rights in this country in the last half century of the 20th century. We heard a reference uh, just a little bit earlier to the People Power Revolution in the Philippines. Tomorrow at lunch you'll be hearing from Czesław Bilecki, who will be speaking about the Solidarity Movement in Poland, which produced political liberty in that country for the first time in a very long time. Let me touch on just a couple of the movements that are listed um, on this graphic because they're not as well known about. One of the perfect little civil resistance movements in history was in El Salvador in 1944. There was a military dictator who had been elected democratically in 1933. He was elected as a compromise candidate because he seemed to be a very liberal general so the generals were happy and the um, peasants were happy and even the coffee growers were happy. Everybody, this guy was like a man for all seasons. He turned out, it seems, to have um, a bit of a, uh, a touch of aberrant behavior. I won't go into that. But he really rather liked power and kept accreting it until the point that by 1940, he was effectively a, an authoritarian dictator. And by the early 40s, El Salvador stayed out of World War II. By the early 40s, 
he was, uh, a bl there was a violent rising against him by 1944, which he bloodily suppressed and lined up hundreds of people against the wall and just shot them in plain daylight. No compunction whatsoever. The worst repression you can imagine. There was one university in San Salvador. The law students and the medical students got together. They were horrified by the state of affairs. They'd never seen such bloodshed before. They realized somebody had to get rid of Martinez. And there was one law student who stood up in that meeting at that university and said, the only way that we can get rid of Martinez is by not giving him anything to shoot at. We have to do this differently. And somebody else said, well, maybe we should look at what Gandhi did. So they were in a university and they spent a couple of days, you know, ransacking the library, looking for books, trying quickly to figure out what Gandhi had done. And so they said, well, we, we can't make ourselves targets, so what should we do? Where, are the, where, where is, where is this, the guy vulnerable? And they realized that El Salvador could probably be brought to a halt if all the businesses shut down and if the transportation shut down. So they started to organize by going to railroad workers, number one. And number two, they went around to everybody who had a shop and a business in San Salvador, because basically it came down to the capital city, San Salvador. Within about a week and a half, they had managed to get everybody on board to a strategy that would call a general strike of the entire country. And that strike was called for the end of the month. The regime didn't see this coming. The, the country was shut down entirely by this general strike. There was nobody to shoot at. It took about one week for the other generals sitting on the junta to decide, well, what does this movement want? It wants Martinez to go. Why don't we oblige them? So they physically took Martinez, escorted him to the border, and said, bye, you know, this general strike, you know, no one is going to benefit from that. Then they came back, and everybody was in the streets celebrating madly. And then the discussion began about what to do next. And there actually was a round table in that country, and they had free and fair elections, which were won by a relatively liberal president. And then there was another president elected after that. Unfortunately, after that, there was a military coup. And San Salvador started its ups and downs, or El Salvador started its ups and downs. But that's, in a nutshell, that's, that's sort of a perfect uh, scenario, if you will. And um, some people will say, the people say, well, there have to be certain conditions. And, well, the regime didn't want to, the regime would know what to do, you know, they, then this would never have happened. But, uh, but this was a people that discovered fully its own power of agency, as all of these peoples have in the 20th century. One way to graph this is just to look at a, a certain, certain periods of time. In the 35 years between 1970 and 2005, according to an empirical study um, managed by Freedom House in 2005, there were actually 67 transitions in that 35-year period from authoritarian to democratic rule. And in 50 of those 67 transitions, the key factor was some form of nonviolent coalitional force. Some force produced by civil society expressed through protests and demonstrations or through other kinds of nonviolent tactics that threw the existing system into doubt, forced negotiations in a roundtable process, or forced the collapse of a government. Even this success in the last third of the 20th century and the first five years of this century is not well known. One expression that you'll usually hear is that, well, it doesn't always work, as if this dynamic we've been discussing and the availability of hundreds of nonviolent tactics fused together with a strategy to sequence these tactics so as to call power into question, call it illegitimate, raise its costs, the existing system, despite the fact that this is hardly a singular phenomenon. It's not an it, I, which is one of the reasons why those of us at ICNC don't wor use the word nonviolence. It's not that we have anything against principle nonviolence, it's that it tends to, to be thought of as a singularity or as a singular force, rather than as something that is developed. It, it, power by the people is something that is distributed, obviously, among all people. And that's evoked and roused, summoned, mobilized, and applied through collective action. So this is hardly in it. 
Therefore, it's always technically wrong, at least, to say, well, it doesn't always work. The use of nonviolent tactics through a campaign and movement can founder and can, in fact, not work in order to produce a desired political outcome. Often not at first. Most movements and campaigns proceed through different stages and phases, sometimes over decades, although there seems to be an acceleration more recently, which is an interesting subject by itself. The best example is Tiananmen Square, the, the, the bloodiest and most colorful example in the last 50 or 60 years was what happened in Tiananmen Square in 1989. We could have a long discussion about that. There are different interpretations about why this happened. The correct interpretation is not because military force was used, because military force has been used many times in many circumstances and was not the decisive factor in producing the outcome. In our view, the key to why this happened and often why there is a perceived failure in the use of civil resistance is Sun Tzu's old aphorism, tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. Meaning that you must know what you're going to do. You have to see one or two stages ahead. And what was present in Tiananmen was a uh, a fabulously well-organized mass demonstration based on remarkable tactical genius that was not supplied with a strategy about what would happen if there was substantial resistance by the existing power holders. The negotiation process started and those who had had the tactical genius to organize the demonstration weren't well supplied with a strategy for engaging in those negotiations. But as I said, we can visit that longer. But there are risks in every choice you make in a nonviolent campaign or movement. You're going to pay certain costs just by organizing, and you're going to assume certain risks depending upon the action you choose to take. All that can be gamed. All that can be foreseen and planned for. And thus, it's wise to consider costs and risks, which will be discussed in more detail um, later today and tomorrow. But thank goodness for these visible tableau that represent the great triumphs of people power because that has at least awakened most of the people of the world to the realization that there have been these successful movements and campaigns in history. What I'd like to do now is to try to help explain what it is about a movement or a campaign that uses civil resistance when it is operating within a society that changes the society. It is, an, it is a myth in my view that regime change accomplishes anything more than ousting a ruler or a set of rulers. That may not at all deal with the systemic pattern of abuse or oppression within the society. It hasn't been rooted up at all. You've cut the top of the grass, you haven't pulled it up by its roots. How then does the use of civil resistance, how can the use of civil resistance also change or transform the society? What's the difference between having regime change and accomplishing the full scope of political, social, and economic change that you need in order to move historically a society from being abused to not just being liberated, but to awakening people to the power they have going forward and to their capacity to develop an entirely new way of being ruled, perhaps a new form of economy, new forms of social relationships. Who knows how human what form human development will take? in the next century, or two, or three, or four. My view is that much of this will come out of the way in which we engage in changing whole societies. And civil resistance used in the last century gives us some important clues to how this transformation of societies can occur through the agency of a movement that uses civil resistance. So these are what I call emergent properties of civil resistance. 
properties, social and political properties that emerge within the society on which a movement using civil, civil resistance has operated, through which such a movement has operated. First of all, there is this idea of consent, the, the enhanced understanding that what I as an individual citizen do or say can play a role in changing a political relationship between me and even the state which presumes to govern me. That acquiring my consent is necessary for you to have legitimacy in your exercise of power over me. I don't have to wait, I don't have to just petition or beseech you to give me a few crumbs. I can challenge your right to exercise power the way you are. Imagine if that is truly awakened by an organic movement operating within the society, how many people come to an understanding for the first time that legitimacy of a system depends on their individual act of providing consent. And they provide consent to a movement when they join a movement. I believe in its goals. I want to participate and engage in that action. This completely recasts the idea of power. It suggests that it is relational and it is not based, in fact, on a sustainable basis on coercion. Sometimes when I give talks I'll be asked, well, you know, but isn't violence a superior form of power? And I'll say, only if you believe that power is physical and only if you do not notice that there is always a relationship implicit between an individual who's threatening violence and the person against whom that threat is being brought. Because the person making the threat of violence wants something. They want you to do something or they want you not to do something. And if a dictator threatens violence against an entire people, he's very interested in ensuring that the, pe that the people do something, pay taxes so he can remain in power, or not do something so that they will not get in the way of what he's trying to do. And if they say no, then they've started a relationship. And if they can identify ways to begin resistance and create space in which to resist, they've activated, they've actually given political force to this idea of consent. This changes the way people think about power in the society. To organize a movement, you cannot force people to believe in you. You cannot compel people, you cannot hypnotize everybody in society. You cannot deceive people into joining a movement that is based on ensuring that anyone in the society who wishes to join can join. You have to use reason. Leaders of nonviolent movements that have been successful are always talking not only to the hopes and aspirations of people, but also to their minds, also to the way they think. They're engaging in a dialogue with thinking people. This predicates the idea of acquiring power not on coercion but on persuasion. I have to convince you to go along with me. And to do that I've got to be honest with you. Because deception works only for a finite period of time. If I continuously tell you the truth, you will have a tendency to believe the next thing I'm going to say. So I'd better be honest if I'm going to be an enduring leader of a nonviolent movement. This can impart a respect for reason and for thinking and for logic which helps in terms of planning and understanding the need to maintain discipline. Spontaneity and passion are good, but they're better if they're channeled through collective forms of action that are undertaken as part of a plan. The plan usually comes with a goal, and if it's a political goal, and if the movement is happening inside a state which is not a democracy, or inside a state which is occupied by, another, by the military of another country, that idea, that goal is often self-rule. Gandhi used the word Swaraj, the Hindu word Swaraj, for self-rule, which means primarily, how do I govern myself? How do I control my impulses? How can I be someone who is accepted in my society? I can't simply, selfishly, be trying to impose my agenda on other people all the time. Um, when a campaign would produce 
uh, episodic violence, Gandhi could well, and did a couple of times, call off the entire campaign. Once he called off an entire campaign in the early 1920s and said, um, we're not ready to govern India, we can't even govern ourselves. We can't even prevent ourselves from being violent in a nonviolent movement. We're going to go back to the villages and dig latrines until we understand what it means to rule ourselves, we can't presume to rule our own country. So there's this relationship between individual action and character and the action and character of the country or the society we wish. And this also helps to awaken people to the need for planning and for discipline. Uh, a graduate student here at the Fletcher School wrote her dissertation on the reasons why security forces froze in the so-called Orange Revolution and didn't crack down as they were ordered to against the mass demonstration in the Maidan. And one, some of the senior military officers said that the thing that they were most impressed with, with the nonviolent demonstrators, was their discipline. Because the military officers could recognize discipline when they saw it exhibited. Yet another reason why discipline is a good idea. But imagine a society that consensually rules itself. Imagine a society based on associative forms of organization that arrive at a common understanding about how people shall be treated in a civil society and how the individual should comport himself or herself as a citizen. Not forced to do it that way by a religion or by a state or by a dictator, but how they develop the desire to do that in a natural way. It comes through this experience of having, having to organize a movement. It can come from this experience of having to organize a movement that then in turn organizes the entire society. There's no such thing as a leader of a nonviolent movement or campaign who can be effective unless they say they want to and they do represent everybody in the movement. If a leader presumes to frame or reframe or propose goals, that leader has to ascertain and understand the grievances and the discontent of the people. Before Gandhi did a single campaign, he spent a couple of years taking the trains, which the British had thoughtfully provided, all around India in order to meet Indians in every walk of life and find out what was bothering them. He needed to know that. He just spent the previous 20 years of his life in South Africa. So he had a lot of homework to do on his own country and his own people. He listened. He invited participation. He readily delegated power. He had to do so in a way that was humble, although he had, in many, in many respects, a natural humility. He couldn't order people to listen to him. He had to model a sense of humility. And this breeds a sense of solidarity that's commonly felt. It doesn't suggest that heroic leaders are powering this movement forward. It's commonly observed today that one of the deficiencies of movements which don't succeed is that they didn't have resilience. They weren't successful because somehow they lacked sustainability. It's not commonly understood, though, what resilience is composed of. Sometimes it's said, well, you have to have enough momentum so that even when things slow down, you're still moving forward, as if a movement were an automobile. Momentum is nice, but you don't get resilience from momentum. My view is that you get resilience from the tissue of people's beliefs, the tissue of beliefs about what is at stake in the nation, the society, or in the action of the movement by those who compose the movement. And it was Jim Lawson who actually gave this idea to me um, a few years ago. Here at FSI, when we were engaged in a discussion, when we were talking about tactics, and there was a presentation that sort of suggested that if you arrive at the right um, assortment of tactics and the right phasing of tactics, that there was some people were reacting to that as if that was mechanistic rather than something that was organic and coming up, upwelling from within the society. And Jim made the following point to me. He said, you know, um, all my colleagues in the civil rights movement who were leading major actions, 
got to the point at some point in the struggle where they came to believe that if they did not give up the movement would succeed and that if they gave up it would fail. Their sense of their own prospects were fused with their sense of the prospects of the movement. They had become one with what they wanted to accomplish. This is full self-giving if you want to be ethical about it. It's commitment of a maximum sort that's not coerced by a senior officer and is not the product of um, training. It, it's a voluntary full commitment of character and mind to the action of a movement. It's an existential commitment. People are certain that they will succeed if they, and Fannie Lou Hamer whose finger, I, I love this finger because to me it shows that this is what we have to do. This is what I want you to do because this is what I'm going to do. Famously, as many of you may know, she at the conclusion of a successful voter registration drive in Mississippi in the 60s, I forget the exact year, was um, her car was stopped by some white police officers late at night on a country road. They pulled her out of the car. They almost beat her to death. She was in the hospital for 30 days and on the 31st day she started another voter registration drive. This is having utter certainty. This gives resilience. This produces transformation in the society <clears throat> as well as in the political or economic arrangements that are responsible for abuses. And ultimately when this process of change is nearing the 11th hour, defectors come to you from the other side because they happen to be part of the society too. Maybe not the elite power holders, but people do defect. And this is often what is the last liquefaction of power that stands within the structure that is to be overcome. Everyone becomes a stakeholder. Everyone is eligible to become a stakeholder <coughs> in doing this change. And this enables people to see that the way the change occurs can be imparted to the society. The kind of society you want is represented in how you aspire to accomplish the change. Vaclav Havel, the leader of the movement in Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia, then Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic and Slovakia, understood how resistance can change everything in a society. He reduced it back to the individual, the action of the individual. He said the individual breaks the rules of the old game by disrupting it. He shatters the world of appearances. To Havel, it was very important to make the individual decision by joining a movement or by joining an action or just by looking at yourself in the mirror in the morning when you're part of an oppressed society that you're living a lie and the lie is that your life is normal. It's not if you live under a condition of oppression. So you have to start telling the truth to yourself and to other people and a movement has to tell the truth to the people of the country for that active force to be summoned from within the society. And that's why Havel suggested the first dissident in a complete totalitarian system has to be arrested because the first dissident threatens the entire system by telling the truth. And that impartation of telling the truth to a society changes the society. It's part of that transformation. So the basis of resistance is a choice of identity. The individual asks himself or herself, who am I? Am I the object of a ruling elite? Am I going to be submissive to threats of violence or just the social anesthesia that prevails in an advanced society? Or am I a citizen able to resist the lie that injustice can't be opposed, able to develop the means to obtain power? There's a demand for militant struggle in the world. There are plenty of people who propose using violence to satisfy that demand. As one of our academic advisors, Erica Chenoweth, uh, now quite well known because of this book, Why Civil Resistance Works, which amazingly won the Woodrow Wilson Book Award from the American Political Science Association. We can hardly believe it that it actually won that award. 
maybe that's a sign of change inside the American Political Science Association, studied 323 violent and nonviolent movements from 1900 to 2006, found that basically nonviolent campaigns were more than twice as successful than violent campaigns during that period of time. This is the history. This is what even the mainstream media are gradually awakening to, although most of them are deeply still in slumber. But um, this is why civil resistance can deliver rights, self-rule, justice, democracy, and the peace that results from people having their rights and being able freely to exercise their rights. I think that is the shortest uh, introduction to the underlying dynamic of civil resistance and how it can change whole societies than I can provide to you. So I'd be delighted to take your questions or comments or objections. <laughs>